So um, I want to talk tonight about a topic that is about really how not to, how not to relate science to faith. That's after Andrew talking about how, how to, ways of doing it, you know, and help, helping that, this is how not to do it. And I want to start with a two-volume doorstopper of a book, the picture of which you see in front of you. So let's unpack the title of this work together. Then we'll talk about the author of the book, this person, Andrew D. White. This book was published in 1896, but its influence on 20th century thinking among scholars, among scientists, even among conservative Christian scholars was just enormous down through the 1970s. So that's ancient history, I know, for many of you. But you know, if you look at people's training, People who were trained today, who were trained by people that were trained in that period before then, the legacy is still with us. And you'll see aspects of the legacy of this book soon, uh, specific concrete examples. But let's look at the title. I think everyone has a, a decent sense, probably, of what a history is. History is something that we all do when we ask our parents where we came from and where they came from and all of that. It's a story about the past. So this is a history of what? Warfare. 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 Uh, there's military language right there. We see a lot more of that tonight. Warfare of what? Of science with what? Theology. Theology. A specific noun. It doesn't say religion. This author didn't believe that science and religion have any conflicts. Not his religion, at least. And science with theology, what is theology? The study of God. The study of God in a kind of formal way, right? Beliefs about God that can be stated in various sentence forms, perhaps. Uh, formally organized thinking about God. It's not kind of, you're not usually see to the pants emotive responses. It's more formal than that, but. Christians have been doing theology since the authors of the scripture, and so it's for a long time. But then, uh, so it's a warfare of science with, with theology, and what does Christendom mean? That's a historian's term. The author of this book was a historian. So Christendom means what? Past 2,000 years. Yeah, basically, in a sense. Can mean that. Since Christ. It can mean that, and the scope of this book was like that. It went back to the church fathers. Uh, Christendom basically is that part of the world where Christianity has been the dominant religious force. Christendom. The term historians often meant, you know, the high Middle Ages into the Renaissance. That would have been what this historian in this book was thinking of, the Christian influence on large parts of the world, especially in Europe and then later in North America. So this is a book about a certain kind of conflict between science and formal theological ideas. It's not religion. Don't think of it as religion. Think of it as specific Christian theology. Could have been written as a history of the conflict between science and Christian theology. That would have been a, a, a shorter or clearer way, perhaps, to say this. I'm going to talk about the author of this tonight at some length, and then talk about other works with similar ideas in them. I'm going to start, though, by pointing out that this isn't just an historical conversation, that many people today believe that science and Christianity are present tense in conflict, and inevitably so. And after the hyphen, this has always been the normal situation in the past. This is what White was writing about. And he would not have said necessarily that Christianity was at war, but he would have said Christian theology, traditional Christian theology, was at war with science. We'll see what his understanding of religious faith was in the course of this, this evening. This is a cover of Time Magazine from back in November 2006. Um, it's interesting. You can download the whole issue if you want. Uh, it's. Um, God versus science, how it's posed, a spirited debate between atheist biologist Richard Dawkins, many of you will know that name, is a, an English biologist, uh, retired now from Oxford, <coughs> zoologist, 
but he wrote, he's, he's not famous for being a zoologist, he's famous for writing books about science and religion, isn't he? And atheism and the world. The other person, Christian geneticist Francis Collins. Uh, probably a lot of you recognize the name Francis Collins. Who's, who's Francis Collins? He's an American. He's the head of the NIH. He's the head of the NIH, that's right. He's the head of the NIH, present tense. In the 1990s, he headed the Human Genome Project. He took that over from James Watson, as in Watson and Crick. Um, he took over directing that. Finished that project as, as uh, he liked to point out, with I think some justification, even though it was a large government project, finished ahead of schedule and under budget. <laughs> and they, they mapped the human genome and the genomes of some other organisms as well, such as mice, as an example. But they, they um, and then he retired. And when he retired, when he was a private citizen, he started Biologos, this organization about Christianity and science. And then he got called back out of retirement by President Obama. He got nominated to be the head of the NIH. That requires Senate approval. You know how, what kind of a divided po country politically we live in. Senate approval, 100 senators, the vote in the Senate to approve him was 99 to nothing. So th that says something right there wow. about his reputation as a human being and as a scientist, right? 99 to nothing to head the NIH. And he still is the head of the NIH right now. Francis is very interested in theology and science and very interested in um, improving our lives through uh, medical biology applications of the genome project. He's a physician as well as a geneticist, he's both. Now, I want to make a jump here to the ideas I want to introduce you to further than just the cover of that magazine. You're looking at a pop psychologist from the United States. His name happens to be David Mills. You may not have heard of him. Probably haven't. But he was, he, he had a lot of readers uh, in the previous decade. Back in 2004, he wrote a book called Atheist Universe, I'll show you the cover of it in a minute, that on Amazon, in the category of atheist books, they, they do keep track of these things, it was the number one bestseller for more than two years. So that's a lot of copies, I don't know the number. But you know, you don't do that just by writing a book tomorrow and just putting it on Amazon. A lot of people are buying it. Until it got surpassed by The God Delusion, that famous book by Richard Dawkins. Dawkins himself called this an admirable book when he refers to it in God Delusion. He does refer to it at least once in those terms. Now he argues in his book that science and religion can't be reconciled. I'm probably not going to surprise you based on what I've already told you about him and his book. Like a lot of other people who write books known as, who are considered to be what, they're, what is often called the new atheists, uh, Dawkins is one of these people. He, wants to use science as a weapon against not just Christian, not just, not just religion, but specifically Christianity in his case. Dawkins is a sort of equal opportunity offender. He likes to go after every and any form of religion. He, Dawkins believes that religion is a virus that we need to eradicate. He's another, he's another conversation that we're not gonna have uh, tonight anymore. What, how's that? Sorry? We, we, oh. we, we've had a bit of a conversation. <laughs> and in, in Mills relies crucially on what I do want to talk about tonight, which is this warfare view <laughs> of the history of science and religion. Now, let's see a few examples. I'm going to quote a couple of sentences from his book, um, where he gets to talking about the history of these things. So, let's read it together. Aside from the wholesale extermination of witches, the Christian church fought bitterly throughout its history and is still fighting today to impede scientific progress. That might be the number one claim of people who hold this warfare view. That certainly was Andrew Dixon White's claim. That this was the role that religion, that Christian theology specifically played in this historical conversation. It wasn't much of a conversation. Christianity was holding back the progress of science at every step. That's what White believed. Galileo, remember, was nearly put to death by the church for constructing his telescope and discovering the moons of Jupiter. That's wildly inaccurate, but I'm not going to talk further about that tonight. For centuries, moreover, the church forbade the dissection of a human cadaver, calling it a desecration of the temple of the Holy Ghost. 
That's not true either. Medical research was thereby stalled for almost a thousand years. It is no coincidence, therefore, that Christianity's longest period of sustained growth and influence occurred during what historians refer to as the Dark Ages. Where are the history majors here tonight? Any? <laughs> Any students here majoring in history? Nobody's nobody from history. Yeah. So, so um, Andrea Sturt, who teaches history at the university, what's what's your view of that sentence? What was the sentence? Something about the dark age. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I can't see the sentence. Uh, it says it says it's no coincidence, therefore, that Christianity's longest period of sustained growth and influence occurred during what historians refer to as the Dark Ages. Yeah, that's crazy. And what, what's what's especially <laughs> crazy about it? Um, well, first of all, just the phrase Dark Ages, which isn't really used today. And, uh, it usually means it's dark because we don't know much about it, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how this author meant it, though. Um, but certainly, is, what does he say, the spread of Christianity was the most in this period or something? Uh, the longest period of sustained growth and influence, yeah. And yeah. That's, that's the, that's the it's, it's no coincidence that the, the longest period of sustained growth and influence is when it was during the Dark Ages. But historians don't, when historians don't refer to it as the Dark Ages. They don't. So th this tells you right away that the author here is not historically qualified um, to, talk, to talk about the history that he is writing about. 1,500 years of progress were therefore stifled by the Christian Church. Were it not for religious persecution and oppression of science, Mankind might have landed on the moon in the year 650. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to tell you what's wrong with that, do I? No. <laughs> Cancer may have been eradicated forever by the year 800. <laughs> and heart disease may today be unknown. I mean, Christianity is to blame for this, folks. Did you know that? But Christianity put into deep hibernation Greek and Egyptian scientific gains in the past. Yeah, I don't have to say anything about that one. You, you can already see on the face of it, this is a crazy claim. But this is a book that becomes so popular that it, it's an Amazon bestseller for more than two years. There's people out there who believe this stuff. An example of this would be Carl Sagan, the late Carl Sagan. He totally believed this, that, that, that the, the Middle Ages was a great gap in, in learning. A great gap in learning. I won't digress on him tonight. Let's go back a lot further in American history, though, to a couple hundred years ago and see an example of this on the part of this guy. Who's that? Jefferson. Jefferson. Yeah, that's Thomas Jefferson. And um, if we go back to the 1780s, to his, to his notes on the state of Virginia, here is a sentence I pulled out of that. It's in context. He says, Galileo was sent to the Inquisition for affirming that the earth was a sphere, that is, that the earth was round. The government had declared it to be as flat as a trencher. Trencher was a, a round wooden plate, flat wooden plate. And Galileo was obliged to abjure his error. Anyone? Anyone critique that? I mean, they knew the Earth was a sphere in the, in the 300 BC. Yeah. They, they, exactly, exactly. And they never lost that knowledge. That's right. I'm going to return to that later on. But that's that's right. And that's Galileo exactly right. went to the Inquisition for the heliocentric model of the universe. That's right. For the idea that the Earth moves, not so much that the Sun doesn't, but that the Earth does. Um, th those two. Uh, that's the idea that got him in hot water. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's a long story, but it has nothing to do with the Earth's shape. Nothing whatsoever to do with the Earth's shape, the Earth's spherical shape. And that was Thomas Jefferson. I'm, I'm assuming he probably got that from some French source. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where else it came from. You know, um, a lot of the French French philosophers uh, had a pretty low view of Christianity and would say all kinds of things, ridiculous things, as well as some true things uh, about the church. Well, here's here's White. Now, here's the author of that two-volume diatribe. Let's meet him. Um, he was a historian. He did not have a doctorate in history. Frankly, relatively few history professors did in the mid 19th century. He did go to Germany, which is where the PhD was in, degree was invented. And he did study, he actually studied with the Theodor von Ranke, who was one of the great historians of the 19th century. But he didn't follow Ranke's sticking with the facts. Okay? Um, and he was the first president of Cornell University. 
There's an A.D. White Hall on Cornell's campus today. Ironically, some years later, he's voted the first president of the American Historical Association. So he's esteemed <coughs> by his historical colleagues. And for generations, historians actually think this book is pretty good before anybody starts really looking into it carefully. And then he launches a crusade against Christian theology in a great venue. This is the venue. That's not him. This is a drawing of Abraham Lincoln in the same venue in the run-up to the 1860 presidential elections. He's giving an anti-slavery speech here in this hall, which still exists. This is the great hall of Cooper <coughs> Union in New York City, in the lower part of Manhattan. And he gets this, he gets this stage because he's giving the first talk in a series of new series of lectures about science shortly after the Civil War. A bunch of scientists speak, but the first speaker in the series is the new president of Cornell, Andrew Dixon White. So he gets out here and he launches his crusade. And he calls his talk the battlefields of science. There's more military language for you. He used that language in lots of other things he wrote that have nothing to do with Christianity. He just liked to use military metaphors. But he speaks about the battlefields of science. And he says he's going to, he gives his audience what he says is an outline of the sacred struggles for the liberty of science. Notice how science has a capital S. A struggle which has been going on for so many centuries. And then for the rest of the evening, he entertains the audience with alleged historical facts um, and exaggerated stories. Among them, I'll give you three. The audience learns that Ferdinand Magellan somehow proved the Earth to be round. Yet as has been pointed out already, everybody knew that, and the educated person knew that for literally millennia. In the 15th and 16th centuries, every university graduate knew this, that the Earth is round. It was in the curriculum in the prior course on astronomy, one of the first points made. I'll come back to that a little later. They also heard that Nicholas Copernicus had escaped persecution only by death, said White. He's referring to the fact that Copernicus literally died on the very day his own book finally came off the press and was placed in his hands. He'd had a series of strokes for about the last six months, and he passed away at that point. That testimony comes from one of his closest friends. Um, even though for 40 years, even though White said that, for 40 years the Catholic Church had been urging Copernicus to discuss openly his ideas. They wanted him involved in very important conversations about the calendar. And so it was not like his views were a secret. Um, he, didn't, he didn't want to publish them because he was afraid of public ridicule uh, for thinking, for the crazy thought that the Earth spins at hundreds of miles an hour and goes around the sun at thousands of miles an hour. It just does not make sense. It does not make common sense. Even today, it doesn't make common sense. And he did not want to argue that position and get ridiculed by everybody. And finally, the work of a Belgian anatomist, Andreas Vesalius, who is the man who revolutionized medical education, not by introducing dissection, because that had been practiced for centuries, but by letting the human body be the text that is read by anatomists. Not text on text on text, written text, but the body itself. That's how he revolutionized medical education. And people in the audience were told that prior to Vesalius, who worked in the 1540s in the Italian University of Padua, the great medical school of the time, quote, dissection of the human body was thought akin to sacrilege. Yet in fact, anatomists had carried out in Italy dissections without anybody bothering them for two centuries before Vesalius was even born. And the practice had spread to several other parts of Europe in the meantime. That deep, there are examples of the practice of surgery for medical purposes in France, for example, in the early 1300s, um, and many other places around Europe. So, why all this fuss? What, what is White's real? What's, what's, what, you know, what's the real bug he's working with here? Why is he saying these things? He believes these things, but why is he saying these things? What's his point? What got him so hot about this? He had written about other subjects earlier in his life, not about things like this. So. Why is he doing this here and now? Well, he's motivated to say these things partly by a political struggle to control some money in the New York State Legislature. During the Civil War, there were the moral, this is moral here, the Moral Land Grant Act is passed, and that partly creates a piece of the University of Minnesota. You have a land grant piece here. And that comes out, and Penn State was created that way, and BPI was created that way, and 
lots of other places. The land grant program is the government, the federal government, gives land to the states for the specific purpose of either using it to put an institution on or selling it to finance an institution that will change the way education is done to make it more inclusive. Instead of being just old-fashioned liberal arts education, it's also going to include practical things like engineering and agriculture. And that's why the ag schools are always with land grants colleges. That's why that's the case. It comes out of this. And so what are you going to do with that money? It leaves it up to the states to decide how to do it. So a political fight takes place in the New York State Legislature about how to spend this, these new funds that they're getting. And White has just recently been elected to the State Senate. He's a former professor from the University of Michigan. He's gone back home to live in New York. And he's been elected to the Senate. And they, put him, they make him the head of the Education Committee. He has a personal distaste, a deep distaste for sectarian colleges. That means colleges that are run by religious denominations, like the Episcopalians. He'd gone to an Episcopalian college himself, or the Methodists, or the Lutherans. He didn't think they were really very good. And he thought that education couldn't flourish in that kind of an environment, too tied to a church. So that's what he meant by sectarian colleges. And lo and behold, New York is full of private colleges even then. And they're all denominational institutions, mostly Episcopalian. And they want to get their share of this pot, right? They've already been there. Some of them are even doing these things, like Union College in Schenectady is already teaching engineering. And they, they want to get, get, get the piece of this action here. There's a couple failed attempts to create new places that will do this, and they fall flat on their faces. So now that this is open up, open up again, the, the, the existing colleges say, come on, we can do this. Finance us, and, and we'll do it. We'll add it to what we do. White doesn't want that. They're all sectarian colleges. So he introduces a, diff, a bill to try to do something different. So this big political fight happens, and charges again get thrown around as to happens in political, in political games. And then eventually White wins with the help of a political ally, another senator named Ezra Cornell, whom you see here, who was a very wealthy man. He made a lot of money in the telegraph industry, which was big in those days, kind of like the IT of its day. And he donates a whole lot of money, something of the order of a half million dollars, more or less, which was real money in those days, to help start this new university, along with the funds coming in from the feds. And so it gets named Cornell because of this big gift that he makes. And he becomes a very f close friend of Andrew Dixon White. And they have very similar views on religion, as we'll see. So now White's opponents make hay out of the fact, of course, that at, right after this happens, the same state senator who pushed this bill through leaves the Senate and becomes the first president of the new institution. You can see how that might play politically, right? And they make that, keep making this point. They're still, they're still angry about all this, about how this went down, how they didn't get any of this. And so White gets his chance to even the score a few years later at his speech at Cooper Union, the one I just told you about. He wants to paint the history of the Christian encounter with science as a great battle between progressive science and religion holding things back. Now that didn't mean that White didn't have just a purely non-sectarian and sense of totally non-religious school. That wasn't the case. He actually believed, he, he thought of himself as a type of Christian, just as Thomas Jefferson did. And he believed that morality was really important. Christian morality was really important. He even had a chapel at Cornell, Sage Chapel, that you see here. But there's a, So there's a religious story here. The religious story is that Cornell results not only from this political battle, it also results from the joint vision of White and Cornell to start this non-sectarian institution. They both despise traditional Christian theology, really, but they both embrace the central moral attitudes of Christianity, specifically the two great commandments Jesus talked about, love of God and love of one's neighbor. They, they, they voice these kinds of convictions. Briefly, for, for um, Cornell, what's his story? Well, he was a Quaker originally. He married a woman who was outside the Quaker fold, an Episcopalian, and he got excommunicated from his Quaker group for doing this. You can see how that might embitter someone. He never joins another church, but for, for, for a long time at the end of his life, he goes consistently to a Unitarian church in Ithaca, which is where Cornell is located. In his opinion, he wrote this, that the Christian gospel tries to shield the deformities of the dead and putrid carcass of the church from the penetrating eye of advancing science and enlightened humanity. That's what he says. Not, not a very complimentary view of, of traditional Christianity. 
he looks to the future with science. He, he has a kind of religion of science, he really does. For, he writes this, the steam engine, the railroad, and the electric telegraph are the great engines of reformation. And then his, the future, he thinks, will and eventually will get a new era in religion and humanity in the 20th century. And it'll be driven by technological progress. And these practical attitudes of loving one's loving God and loving one's neighbor. As for White, he grows up an Episcopalian in a fairly religious family. But he, as a young man, comes to reject what he calls the narrow and medieval teachings about salvation. He always uses the adjective medieval as a pejorative, not as a descriptive. That was very common in the late 19th century. Anything medieval was backward. And so he uses that adjective and, and throws it at Christian theology. And when he's in college at Hobart College, which is an Episcopalian college in those days, he just found miracles unbelievable. And even though he would be exposed to traditional Christian apologetics, he found that very <coughs> unpersuasive. So he quickly, as a young man, moves on into something that a moral basis in Christianity, but no theological basis in Christianity. In fact, he thinks dogma is backward. His credo is best captured in words he himself borrowed from the great English poet Matthew Arnold. So if you know anything about Matthew Arnold, you'll see Matthew Arnold here. White says, religion is the recognition of, and then these, well, the quote within the quote is from Arnold, a power in the universe, not ourselves, which makes for righteousness. That's Matthew Arnold, and White owns that. He puts those words at the very end of the preface to that big two-volume work, in fact. This is what he hopes is going to come down the road, that type of religion. And in love of God and of our neighbor. I mean, not that these are bad ideas, but it's, it's his negativity toward traditional theology and any, any denominational involvement in education that he really finds <laughs> a problem. Now, as a briefer piece to this, this is another important name, another New Yorker, actually. <coughs> Although this man's born in England, he's primarily a New Yorker as an, as an adult. He lives all of his adult life in America. There's a chemist at, at New York named John William Draper. He's famous, among other things, for taking the first photograph of the moon all the way back in the 1830s. He kind of converts himself into a quasi-historian um, later in his career. And he writes these long monographs about the history of ideas. Um, he becomes, though, the first president of the American Chemical Society, an enormous professional group today. So you've got the first AHA president, the first ACS president involved in this story. And he writes a book in the 1870s called this, A History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science. And if you're thinking you just saw that title, you're right, sort of, right? It's not a history of the warfare of science with theology, but it sounds like a history of the conflict between religion and science. And it's mainly an anti-Catholic book. I won't detail the things that make it an anti-Catholic work here and tell why that was so. But it does do more than that. It does advance a grand narrative of science versus religion. In the preface, here's one sentence from the preface, but this summarizes the whole book. The history of science is not a mere record of isolated discoveries. It is a narrative of the conflict of two contending powers. And, and you already know what they are. So the expansive force of the human intellect on one side, that's the good guys. That's science and reason, really. And the compression arising from traditionary, odd adjective, traditional will do fine, from traditional faith and human interest on the other. And of course, that's where religion is. So it's this, the, the history of science is a narrative of two contending powers. That's the, that's the picture he paints. Now, what is wrong with this view from the point of view of modern historians? I'll give you five specific sound bites from leading historians of science from all over the world. I mean, from all over the English-speaking world, at least. These are really leading people in their fields. I'll tell you who they are when I show them to you. And what have they said about this grand narrative of conflict? Well, here's Lawrence Principe from Johns Hopkins. He's the author, among other things, of the little tiny short introduction book to the Scientific Revolution in that big Oxford series of little short introductions. You probably know what I mean. He says this, many people today acquiesce in the widespread myth devised in the late 19th century of an epic battle between scientists and religionists, despite the unfortunate fact that some members of both parties perpetuate the myth by their actions today. This conflict model has been rejected by every modern historian of science. 
it does not portray the historical situations. That's the bottom line problem. It just does. It's not. It's not accurate at all. It doesn't look like the history really looks like. Here's a very short quip from the leading American, the leading historian of American science and medicine, and that's Ronald Numbers, just recently retired from Wisconsin. I'm going to notice this picture here because if you're looking for a quick read, easy read on a lot of this material, pick this book up. It's called Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion. Galileo never went to jail. And it's, um, it's published by Harvard University Press. The chapters are all written at a New York Times level. That was the instruction authors were given. Each chapter, for the most part, each chapter is limited to 2,500 words. That's you know pretty short. Um, read it in 20 minutes, and you can get they're, they're dense, but they're well written. So there's a lot in here. So here's what number says: Historians of science have known for years that Whites and Draper's accounts are more propaganda than history. In other words, the, I've explained the propaganda part, but they're not history. In other words, you're gonna you, this is really enhanced stuff. It's it's a huge spin on the historical episodes themselves. His partner at University of Wisconsin and teaching for years and years and years, who's now dead, David Lindbergh from the same program, wrote this. For more than a century, historians of Christianity and science like White have wasted their time and dissipated their energies attempting to identify villains and victims, often with polemical or apologetic intent and always within a framework heavily laden with values. In other words, this is a similar judgment to the one about it's just <coughs> propaganda. It's not really accurate historical writing at all. Lindbergh was among the three or four most important historians of medieval science at the time of his death. Or a leading historian of medicine, not just ancient medicine, but medicine and religion, as well as uh, many other aspects of it. This is Gary Ferngren of Oregon State. While some historians had always regarded the Draper-White thesis as oversimplifying and distorting a complex relationship, which it certainly does, in the late 20th century, he means since about the 1970s, it underwent a more systematic reevaluation. The result is the growing recognition among historians of science that the relationship of religion and science has been much more positive than is sometimes thought. For more on that, Come back Thursday night. <laughs> but you know, there, that, one of the problems is you have no idea from reading this that anything, anything really interesting and good happened between science and religion, and a lot of stuff did. And the final one comes from the leading British scholar of the history of science and religion, John Hedley Brooke, recently retired from Oxford. He's the author of what I would say is still probably the definitive historical overview of science and religion back in 1991, just called Science and Religion from Cambridge University Press. And John would say it like this. Serious scholarship <laughs> in the history of science has revealed so extraordinarily rich and complex a relationship between science and religion in the past that general theses are difficult to sustain. The real lesson turns out to be the complexity. Now, the general theses are difficult to, to sustain. In other words, overarching historical claims such as there's in inevitably been conflict between Christian theology and science. Overarching historical claims don't work. That the real history is much too complex for that. It's much it's you know it's 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 not nearly this clean little picture when you get down dirty and look at the history. It's far from that. So that's a different kind of criticism of the claim by that professional historian. If you're getting the picture that modern historians don't think Draper and White have any value at all, you're getting the right picture. Uh, what they do have value for is showing what they thought at that time. They're valuable as primary sources as historians would say, for seeing what was thought at that point in American history about these things, but not as reliable places and sources of information about what actually did happen in the past. Anybody recognize this event shown in this picture? This is, this is a picture from the, American, from the National Museum of American Art, part of the Smithsonian. It's not on the mall. It's a couple blocks off the mall by Peter Rothermel from 1841. What scene is this? You have this woman up here on a platform, this man down here, looks like he's pleading a case, and a globe on the floor. 
What, what do you think this is? Anyone? What do you think that is? Columbus. Yeah, good guess. Appealing <laughs> for appealing for money, I'm appealing for money. Right. This is his grant application. Yeah. Columbus is appealing for money from <laughs> Isabella the, and, her, and, and her husband, Ferdinand. She, but she, she's kind of got the fingers on the purse here. And, and he, he, wants to, he wants to get some investment in his voyage. What does he want to do? He wants to do what? Get to the West East Indies. Yeah, and in a new way, right? No, he's going to go west instead of east. Go west instead of east or south, right? Not south around Africa yeah. and then across the Indian Ocean, as the Portuguese have been doing for a century at this point. But he wants to go west, west, right? <laughs> Off the edge of the flat curve. Yeah. <laughs> Supposedly, that's the objection, right? Supposedly, the objection is, well, everybody believes they're going to fall off the earth, and, th and don't, don't do this, you know? Don't do this. If the earth isn't round, Columbus, you're wrong, you know? How can you be so crazy? That's how it's presented, even in so many school books, almost to our own time. How many of you learned that in school? I'm curious. Yeah, isn't that astonishing? Astonishing. I did, too. So to my daughters, they had it in their textbooks in the 1990s. I went and actually wrote, well, I'm a nerd, you know, so I wrote a letter to the principal and said, look, I'll, I'll come in and explain the real story if you want. <laughs> I don't think anybody believed me. You know. But... Uh, <laughs> Yes, at the time I went to the to the, one of the museums in Williamsburg where they had an orrery, you know, these mechanical universes, an orrery on display. And they said the orrery was named for Sir Robert Boyle, the Earl of Orrery. Well, there was, Boyle never had a title. The Earl of Orrery was a grand nephew. He never had a sir in his name. And it wasn't built in his lifetime. I tried to explain these things to the person there at the museum. I didn't believe me. <laughs> but there it is. <laughs> These conversations happen, you know. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're a scholar of humanities, you know this. These conversations happen. So, let's take a look at the most, at the at closer look at this, at this myth, this myth of Columbus and the flat Earth. Here is an image taken out of a book I looked at just two weeks ago at the rare book collection at the University of Oklahoma, where they have a tremendous collection of science textbooks from before 1500. This one was printed in 1488. That's four years before Columbus, right? That much history you probably agree on, right? 1488. The book is called De Sphera, that is, On the Sphere, which really means the sphere of the stars, not the sphere of the Earth. But one of the first teachings in the book is that the Earth itself is spherical as well. This was by the monk John of Sacrobosco. It was the standard astronomical text for introductory text in the medieval university and into the Renaissance. It was literally used for 400 years. 200 years in manuscript versions, 200 more in printed versions. Didn't disappear in use until the 17th century. So, but this is the standard book. Astronomy was required, of course, at most universities. So maybe you weren't taking it, maybe you dropped out, like a lot of people did. Your friends might have taken it, but any educated person knew that the Earth is round. They knew it. It wasn't, it wasn't something that was a conjecture. This was taught as fact in these astronomical printers, all based on Claudius Ptolemy, the ancient world. So contrary to what you and many others have been taught, the Earth's spherical shape, and for that matter, its approximate size, have been widely known since before the time of Christ. In all parts of the world descended from the Mediterranean world. Okay, that whole part of the world, which includes all the medieval universities. And that knowledge was never lost. You don't have a tradition in the Middle Ages of people thinking the Earth is flat that we have can identify, you know, 50, 60, 80 people in a long tradition of think of flat earthers. They, they're not there. So this is maybe maybe ordinary people might have believed that. Maybe there's all kinds of things ordinary people believe even today, right? I mean, 50% of Harvard graduates don't know that if you let go of a thing swirling over your head and let it go, it goes off in a straight line. Um, so there's all kinds of things ordinary people believe. But you would never know this. You'd never know this at all from reading Draper on the Earth's spherical shape. On the Earth's spherical shape, he says in this controversy with Columbus, as might be expected, it, meaning the spherical shape of the Earth, was received with disfavor by theologians. I don't know why that must be expected, might be expected, but that's what Draper says. He says, it, its irreligious tendency, meaning the spherical shape, its irreligious tendency was pointed out by the Spanish ecclesiastics and condemned by the Council of Salamanca, which is the oldest university in Spain. And its orthodoxy was confuted 
from passages in Scripture and the church bodies. Never mind that there never was a council of, 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 of professors from Salamanca that talked about this. And never mind that some of the fathers he names never criticized the round earth. Never mind any of that. Draper concluded that the decisive blow to the Earth's flatness really came from Magellan and the fact that Magellan circumnavigates the globe. He says, henceforth, the theological doctrine of the flatness of the Earth was irretrievably overthrown. Now, Draper's book is very, very widely read and translated into many, many languages, including Portuguese, which means all that audience in Brazil. And remember, it's an anti-Catholic work. Um, but after World War II, the leading historian of Columbus, that's uh, Samuel Eliot Morrison of Harvard, a former naval officer in World War II. He writes naval history, mostly. He, he, um, he, he writes a biography of Columbus, Admiral of the Ocean Sea. And in that book, he says, he looks at that whole fable, and he says it's misleading and mischievous nonsense, is how he describes it. Yet it still finds its way into school books for the rest of the 20th century. Go figure. Even the Librarian of Congress, former Librarian of Congress, Daniel Borston, puts it in one of his books in 1983. So if you want to read more about this and the story behind the story, I'll recommend a very, very short historical book, less than 100 pages. It's called Inventing the Flat Earth. And it's written by UCSB historian Jeffrey Burton Russell, who's now retired. Uh, Jeff Russell is a medievalist, an expert on medieval ideas and he looked all over the place for what kinds of sources would support this kind of interpretation, and he simply didn't find them. As he points out, the critics of Columbus, and there were plenty, who told the queen not to do this foolhardy thing, okay? The critics of Columbus were right. Columbus believed that the Earth is a whole lot smaller than it is. The question wasn't shape, it's size. He thought it was close to 18,000 miles in circumference. It's actually about 25,000. And he thought Asia is a lot bigger than it actually is, the landmass of Asia. And so he, he lowballs the Earth's circumference. He puts a bigger, much bigger number than, than, than really is acceptable on the size of Asia. And so he ends up calculating it's 3,000 miles from Spain, due west to Japan. Not quite, right? Not quite. <laughs> and his critics knew that. They knew it was much closer to 10 or 12. They knew that he was never coming home, that, he would, that those people leaving on that voyage were going to die at sea. They were going to die, they were going to run out of food and water, and that's it. Don't invest in this foolhardy venture. So the earth, the issue wasn't the shape of the earth at all, it was its size. And Columbus was totally wrong about that. Well, where does this myth come from? Well, one place it comes from, other than Draper, a much earlier source, is the very famous short story writer, Washington Irving. <laughs> that many of you know about, right? He, what did he write, for example? Ichabod Crane. Yeah. Ichabod Crane. Crane, yeah. Rip Van Winkle, right? This is the legend of Sleepy Hollow, stories like that. Washington Irving, a very gifted short story writer, who also writes a four-volume biography of Columbus, which is partly fictional. <laughs> um, he, he makes a hero out of Columbus in this book. And this is a time when anti-Catholic feeling among Americans is very high in this pre-Civil War period. I mean, there's too many of these people coming into New York from places like Ireland and, and Italy. And a lot of Protestant Americans are worried about this. And he writes, he gives an anti-Catholic spin to the Columbus story by pointing out that all these Catholic university professors and theologians are the ones that oppose Columbus. They're the ones that think the earth is flat, these stupid idiots. And this is the kind of way the story is spun, basically. The, the work itself is a four-volume work published in Paris in English. Irving was working in Europe at that point, in 1829. And so this, you know, this has the appearance of being a solid scholarly biography, but it ain't. It's, it's got a lot of fiction in it. And this is a, paint, a painting I only just learned about last week from 1849, and it pretty much shows this episode where you have Columbus, who doesn't have, you know, advanced degrees from the university, is arguing against a council of Catholic intellectuals. You see even the guy with the, the bishop's hat on and such. Uh -huh. Really the opposition to him, right? That's, that's what they depict this as. And this event just simply didn't happen. The, this council of intellectuals who quote the Bible against Columbus in this way, against a round earth. 
There is a theological issue that comes up. You can ask me about afterward if you want. It has to do with what's called the antipodes. And you can ask me about that. I'm not going to go into that. But he just invented this stuff. And that he outdoors this university council. Now what Jefferson and Irving and Draper all have in common is an animosity toward Catholicism. And they don't hesitate to create or repeat myths to embarrass the Roman church. Now, White's diatribe is more generally directed at all groups of Christians who don't share his liberal religious views. So, but that, that, that these, these works really form the American mindset for a long time. In fact, you see the flatter story even in late 20th century textbooks for children. You see it. And in the popular mind all over the place, let alone in Bugs Bunny cartoons. <laughs> uh, to wrap it up, let me raise the question, why in the world has anybody ever had their wool pulled over their eyes on this? Especially in the 19th century when art history began to become an important discipline. You're looking at a picture of the West Portal of Westminster Abbey in London, which is, which is uh, built in the 13th century, 1200s. Here you have Jesus sitting, sitting down, making the authority gesture with his right hand, and holding what in his left hand? What's he holding? That is a globe, right? Unmistakably a globe. What's on top of the globe? Cross. A cross. What does that mean? It means that Jesus has died for the sins of the whole world. Okay? This is a very common iconography called Christ in Majesty. You find this in a lot of medieval art and earlier in Byzantine art, this theme. This was used, you know, to educate people. Almost everybody in the Middle Ages is illiterate. And this is, this is used to educate the illiterate people coming back and forth to church about the importance of Jesus. It's not, it's not trying to teach them that the world is round, but that's assumed, isn't it, in the artwork. Or here's a, here's a, a, um, a, a uh, stone, uh, um, what's, the, what's the word I want here, art people? It's not a sculpture, it's relief. A, relief. A, a, relief. A, relief. a relief. A relief, thanks, that's the word I want, a relief from a French cathedral in the 14th century, of God creating the world, and there's, a, there's God's creating the world round. Or uh, 15th century, pre-Columbian 15th century, Fra Angelico, the great Italian Renaissance artist, there, there's the Christ and Majesty theme in painting, and that, that world's still round. You know? the, the, with all of this kind of art out there, and in churches of all places, how can this claim ever have traction? This claim that, that medieval Christians believe the world is flat. And, and you know, use the Bible to support that. I, where's that coming from? You know, well, I've given you some examples of where it's coming from. So why does this all matter? <laughs> well, uh, these two fellows are good at this about dragging in these kinds of myths, especially Carl Sagan, who was the most famous scientist in the world 40 years ago. He was he was on the Johnny Carson Tonight Show a lot, and his Cosmos series, seen by people all over the world. Even today, when it's you can, you can you can buy it in DVD, all over the world, and you can stream sections of it that people have put up. Even though the creators of the series don't want you to be able to do that, um, and Sagan's series was on television, public television. I don't know around the time I was in college, a long time ago, and it was used in a lot of high schools and colleges and courses. And Sagan's, Sagan's stuff is full of the mythology of science and religion. I'll show you a place in the end, the last slide, where you can go and read about it if you want. But the warfare view is just too easily dragged into culture wars. And some use it to dismiss religious ideas from serious consideration, don't they? When in fact, religion has often been a source of ideas, motivation, and energy in the history of science. I'll talk about that Thursday. There's, however, also at the same time, a lot of conservative Christians also encourage the conflict view, right? even though they don't see it that way themselves. They don't see it that way. They don't think the science that's, that they oppose is genuine science. They think it's false science. So they don't see it as a conflict of science with religion. When I think it is, as they see it. They reject many conclusions in the historical sciences, so-called, <laughs> like geology and paleontology and cosmology and evolutionary biology. They don't regard those conclusions as genuinely scientific. Despite the fact that almost all, I mean almost all means well over 90%, almost all Christian scientists accept those conclusions of those sciences. Finally, 
many liberal Christians, and I'll define that in a moment so you see what I mean by that term in this context, actually accept White's view. They, I don't think they would agree with me, but I think it's very clear they do. Accept White's view that the central doctrines of Christianity must be left behind in the name of science, including the incarnation, the resurrection, and in the case of John Shelby Spong, even theism itself. John Shelby Spong is the retired bishop of Newark, Episcopal Church. I think there's a text about that in scripture somewhere. Isn't there a case where can any good thing come out of Newark? Is he from Texas? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's, he's written a number of books, including this one, Why Christianity Must Change or Die. And he argues in this and other works that theism itself must be left behind. Christians need to go beyond theism. He uses that phrase, beyond theism. Why? Because those things are not true, and they've been shown not to be true by science and reason, among other things. So this is what the bishop, of, former bishop of Newark believes. He has a very, very big following in, in American religious circles, especially at Chautauqua in New York, the sort of classic old lecture stand for, um, for Christians and others since the 19th century. And he, he's often speaking there and at things like that around the country and in many other, other venues. In my view, folks who think like Spahn unwittingly accept White's conflict view. I don't think they even know what it was. Um, they, 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 uh, they see conflict of that kind, and that's what White was talking about. So they're advocates of the conflict metaphor. They won't think so, but they are. Uh, that's what White was talking about. Last slide. So if you want to read more about aspects of this, one place you could go is Biologos. Uh, commercial time now, right? <laughs> this is, one of, this is a, a post I put up about a year ago. Um, called How Liberal Protestants, and in this case I didn't mean Spong, I was talking about people 100 years ago, bought White's conflict thesis and lost their faith. And I talk about some examples there. One of the examples I bring in, by the way, was the most famous liberal preacher in America of the 1920s, a man named Harry Emerson Fosdick. Some of you may know that name. He read White after his freshman year in college, which was 1896. And he says, as a result of reading it, he loses his faith in these traditional Christian attitudes, especially he loses his, his belief in the inerrancy of the Bible, but he loses a lot of other things along the way as well. This man was regarded by the, you know, you probably all know that Martin Luther King Jr. was a preacher. You know, he wasn't a politician, he was a preacher, he was a great preacher. And he believed, King believed, the greatest preacher he'd ever heard was Harry Emerson Fosdick. So that's, that's the kind of reputation Fosdick had. He had one of the first national radio programs, in fact. Of, of preaching from the, in the early 20s. Um, so it, this is a hugely influential person, and his own personal biography has a few big piece of Andrew Dixon White in it by his own admission. So this is, this is stuff that influences a whole lot of the American religious landscape for a long time, and the American scholarly landscape for a long time. The founder of my discipline, the history of science, Georges Sarton, a Belgian, who founds the History of Science Society Founds its first, as editor, founds the first two journals in my field called, named after Egyptian gods, Isis, bad name today, and mm -hmm. Osiris, okay? The very first article he publishes in Isis is his own piece in French in which he tells people that this is how he's going to treat the subject and he says laudatory things about Andrew Dixon White. So mm -hmm. this is a follower of Andrew Dixon White who founds the history of science and it takes generations to recover from that. So that's where I'm going to end and ask for questions and comments. Mm -hmm. uh, who do you think has uh, done more damage, these two combined or Edward Gibbon? Hmm. Oh, that's a nice question. Um, on our current way of thinking, in the, in the more modern world, I would say, I, in, at least in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in an English-speaking context, I would say, Andrew Dixon White and Draper. Yeah, I would. Because of the way in which science has arisen of such cultural importance in, in our society. Whereas the history of Rome is kind of, you know, it's a backwater compared to, in today, compared to the interest people have in science. Um, were there hints of this conflict view before White, and did he kind of amplify that, or did it really seem to be kind of an invention? It's, the, for, it's the former. Yeah, you saw the Jefferson quote from a, you know almost a hundred years before White. 
the origins of this thesis are still not entirely clear. But it does seem clear that there's at least two different pieces that lead to it, historically. The first piece is this type of liberal religion that was common in the 19th century, including in England. You know what Matthew Arnold was. A lot of the Victorians who lost their faith in traditional Christianity for various reasons get this kind of more vague spirituality that they really latch on to and they want to promote. People other than Matthew Arnold, you know, some of the most famous novelists and others. Wordsworth <coughs> is kind of like this too. Um, so George Eliot, people like that. So there's that current, and it, that's in America too. It's in people like Henry David Thoreau, and um, late in the century, John Muir, the very famous environmentalist. He's kind of a quasi pantheist. This type of this type of thinking is really common in the 19th century. So that alternative spirituality, let's call it that. That's a big big piece. It's a piece for Draper. It's a and, uh, it is a piece for Draper. I didn't talk about that part. It is a piece for White, and it's a piece for Edward Cornell. The other piece is perhaps more surprising, the Reformation. Um, Post-Reformation um, arguments between Protestants and Catholics over religious authority. One of the arguments most commonly made against Catholics comes right out of the Galileo affair where Protestants in North America in the 19th and 20th centuries and in England then and earlier are very quick to drag up Galileo and say, and basically in the spirit of, that's not us. You know, and we're much freer in our thinking about these things. We don't have problems with these issues, but the Catholics do. And so this kind of warfare view under which Catholicism is a war with science, it grows out of the Galileo affair. So I would say those two currents are part of the background. A lot more historical work needs to be done on this. The only thing I'm commenting, saying is true from those two pieces is because this last, about a year ago, I was the external reader for a dissertation on exactly this from Queensland, University of Queensland. And the scholar was, was tracing a lot of these things. So I'm just kind of giving you a quick summary of that part of the thesis, which was an excellent thesis. Um, and then there was other material on Draper and White that I've also drawn on from that thesis. Yes. Okay, so this isn't exactly related to the history of science, but I won't be here for the next two lectures, so may I still ask it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, in your mind, personally, reconcile the idea of entropy with providence? To be more specific, if you could, I know what entropy is and I know what providence is, but I don't see that connecting well, stops. If entropy is true, then the universe and everything in it is heading towards an evenly distributed field of particles at the same temperature, slightly above absolute zero. The heat death of the universe. Yes. Yeah. How does that fit in with God's plan in your mind? Because it seems sort of like a general death, rather than any sort of life and creation. Is it just a product of the fall in your mind, or...? Now I see your question. Um, entropy has been a subject of a lot of conversation in the science theology area for a long time. It just may be below most people's radar. And um, cosmologists have thought about this a lot, including especially Arthur Eddington, perhaps the greatest cosmologist of the last century, certainly a candidate for that, uh, who was worried about God's action in the universe. He, he, didn't, he didn't believe in the Big Bang Theory when he eventually came along, because he thought God wouldn't do it that way but it had to be kind of always the same in the history of the universe. But uh, I'll put it like this. Um, is it providential to have a new heaven and earth? Sure. And replace this earth, which is running down, with a different one that won't run down. And so... It depends on the kind of theological take you want to put on that question, which is a, a very nice question. So if, if, if entropy is about the universe running down, then any hope we might have as Christians for an ultimate future is not going to be in this universe. It, it's going to be in something that must transcend this universe. We're not going to get it from this one, because this universe is indeed running down into a heat death. So and that, that's, that's ultimately, in my view, one of the basic um, 
aspects of the doctrine of creation from nothing, um, well, I, I, which I believe. Uh, the Creatio ex nihilo, as it says in Latin, is about the ultimate dependence of all things upon God. That's the, that's the bottom line version of what Creatio ex nihilo is about. And, and, it's, and it's that God is sovereign over nature itself and the kind of nature it is. When God made nature, God wasn't subject to any other things telling God what to do. And so nature expresses God's purpose for this world. But that's not the whole story, because the story also has a part B, and that's where God's purposes are culminating. I mean, that, that's what scripture of teaching would be, and that's also really the way Paul puts it. In, in the first, the oldest accounts of the resurrection in scripture are in 1 Corinthians 15, and when Paul says, for example, that Christ is the first fruits of them that slept, N.T. Wright and many others have talked about this. What that really means is Christ is the first example of that next world. Christ's glorified body is the first example of that, of the example that we too will eventually share with him, that, that, that exemplar. So he's the first fruits of them that's left. This is the future world breaking into our world. So whatever hope we're going to have isn't in our world. This is the resurrection is not an event that can be explained within the understanding we have of our world as we find it now. That, if anything violates entropy, it's that. Okay? So it's, it's something else. It's something else. Yes? Uh, this is somewhat like, I, my view on like this whole, like, uh, I guess, the myth of uh, science versus religion, I think it's just kind of like one hydra head of like the whole thing, the whole creature is like the whole narrative of progress, in my opinion, and I think it's because that encompasses the science view, it encompasses the social view, and economics, and everything. And how much do you think that is, uh, it's part of that same monster, or do you think it's just some historical Well, it, it does buy into that general narrative, uh, the, the August Comte type of narrative from the 1830s, 40s, the idea that, that the, the primitive stages of, of human thinking get replaced by the more advanced Wiggish stages history. of human. Yeah, very much Wiggish history. Right. If you know that term, well done. <laughs> Have you read it? You've been reading Butterfield? Herbert Butterfield? No, sorry. Okay. Okay. The Wiggish history made me, talk to me afterward if you want to know why I thought that. Maybe you were reading Butterfield. Um, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the progress narrative, yes progress narrative of that kind. Uh, and there are multiple progress narratives, of course. Yeah, Marxist history, too. And, well, Francis Bacon. Um, Francis Bacon has a progress narrative. Uh, his, 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 he writes a book in 1605 called The Advancement of Learning. Mm -hmm. and, and Bacon, Bacon's not a scientist. He's a political philosopher, an essayist. But he is the prophet of science. He, 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 he determines, really, he has a vision within England of what, what natural philosophy, we call it science today, what natural philosophy is for, and ultimately it is for the improvement of the human condition. I mean, Bacon has been accused of lots of things, including you know, just believing everything knowledge is power, and that's all there is. I think that badly misreads Bacon. I think his whole point is, he says, in the advancement of learning, he basically says, Let's, let us, let no one say that a person can learn too much, can be too learned in the book of God's word or the book of God's works, divinity or philosophy. But rather let him um, seek for basically an endless proficiency in both, but let him apply that learning to charity, not to ostentation. Okay? To charity not to ostentation. I don't know how many people read Bacon carefully, but that's what Bacon says. To charity, and not to ostentation. To use, not to stuffing oneself up. He goes on and talks about this. So, for Bacon, the engine of progress, but which is going to be charitable progress, is natural philosophy. It's going to produce all kinds of wonderful things. He talks about this in the New Atlantis. All kinds of things we're going to get out of natural philosophy, stuff like strawberries that weigh 50 pounds, and people who can project light over long distances, and people who can fly in the air, um, things of this nature, that this is what it's going to do. 
And so that's a, it's a progressive vision based on material progress, but it is directly connected with it's given a biblical sanction. Particularly, what needs to happen, see, what, what natural philosophy can do is to help us overcome some consequences of the fall uh, for Bacon. Not the moral consequences, for that we need religion, but the intellectual consequences. Bacon believed that Adam and Eve lost much knowledge in the fall. And so we can recover some of that knowledge through the arts and sciences, as he says. So this is a vision of intellectual progress to kind of restore where we were at one time. And it, but it's a moral program. You want to use it for charity. Yes? Does it seem like, it seems like a lot of these people treat science as a sort of religion? It's almost like a bait and switch. Like they have their own axioms they believe, they have dogmas, they have prophets. But then they rush in and say, no, this is objective truth. So like right at the last minute, they exchange that. And it can't be religion, right? Right. Because religion, we all know, is bad. Right. So it can't be that. <laughs> but in fact, it is functionally. Mm -hmm. Functionally. I mean, scholars of religion who aren't personal believers in any, in any particular classical religion, I think pretty much nearly all agree that someone like Richard Dawkins is religious. He's engaging in a religious enterprise. Scholars of sociology looking at behaviors of these groups would say maybe much the same thing, that these are doing religious activities. For example, Gordon Kaufman, um, a theologian at Harvard Divinity School, who writes about what religion is, points out that religion does certain things for people. It gives them an origin story. It gives them a narrative about morality. It gives them a source of values. And science does that for many people in our time. There's a term that maybe someday I'll write a history of called the religion of science. And that language that I just quoted has been used in the United States since before the Civil War, the religion of science. It's meant different things to different people. But they've all, what it, they all have in common is, they believe science and reason should replace traditional faith. That's the August Comte version of progress, that, that science can replace that and function the same ways. It will fill the same roles. You know? So science becomes the final arbiter of truth. Science becomes the source of every good and perfect gift, these types of things, the source of our ultimate hope. So, those are traditionally religious functions, but for people of the type that buy into the Draper White or much more, even to the much more anti-religious program of Richard Dawkins or Jerry Coyne or Lawrence Krauss are really practicing a kind of religion. Just don't dare call it that mm -hmm. because they won't agree with you at all about that. But I, I, think, I think it's true. That's what's going on. Functionally, it's like religion. Yes, so sir. were there ever periods of time within the church where there was intellectual decline? Because we do know that there was periods where there was moral decline. I, I, it seems that in your lecture that it was um, implicit that you were assuming that scientific progress was continuous rather than um, what you just said. Um, I believe that you said Locke, he believed that we lost. <coughs> we lost knowledge and we regained. Bacon. bacon. Was it, was it, yeah, bacon. Uh, <coughs> was there a period of time where there was say, an intellectual decline where some of these criticisms that atheists had brought up, was, was there ever a time where that actually was the case? Uh, yes. Um, uh, I'll qualify it, because it's in a highly qualified sense. That term dark ages that historians no longer use arises partly because of something that does happen in the world of the history of ideas. That is, there's a, there's a fairly large gap of knowledge between Roman, the old Roman Empire after it collapses in the Latin speaking part of Europe for centuries from the Roman times down to the high middle ages. There's a, there, there's a lot, there's a, the knowledge is not there for those people in the Latin language. 
that is still there for the old eastern part of the Roman Empire, the Greekish part of the Roman Empire. In the wake of Alexander, you know, before the Roman Empire, Alexander comes out of Macedonia, and his teacher as a boy is Aristotle, and he carries Greek, and, uh, Greek science and other knowledge with him throughout the whole empire, and the legacy is there for centuries, that legacy of the Greek knowledge. They never lose track of that. So the works of the, of the great Greek scientists and physicians like Galen and Aristotle and Ptolemy and others is never lost in that part of the world. It is lost in the old Ro western part of the Roman Empire, the Latin part of the Roman Empire. They preserve some things, but there's so much they do not have. Uh, for example, the only work of Plato that they have in any large quantity is Timaeus, which is a creation story of Plato's. They have about two-thirds of that in Latin translation, prepared in antiquity in Roman times. They don't have the Greek originals of Timaeus, and they don't recover those Greek originals of Timaeus until the Renaissance. And, and, and so, you know, when there's a much more contact between those two parts of the world. So there is a lot of knowledge that the ancient world had that kind of disappears from view in the western part of the old Roman Empire for centuries. So there's, there is kind of a knowledge vacuum for that reason. That doesn't have anything to do with Christianity whatsoever. It has to do with differences in culture and language and sophistication between the old eastern part of the Roman Empire and the old western part of the Roman Empire. And Roman attitudes themselves towards some of this knowledge, which they weren't interested in the theoretical knowledge of nature in the Roman Empire. They were in the old Greek uh, world. And, and then it also has to do with the cultural collapse of the West. As, as you well know, um, the Roman Empire is divided into two administrative sectors, basically, in around, around what, around the third century? Andrew, you would know this exactly. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the Greekish world centered on the capital city that Constantine builds for himself, Constantinople, which later becomes Byzantium, which later is conquered by the Muslims in the 15th century and is now called Istanbul. That city is built to be the capital of the eastern half of the empire, which is a lot richer, a lot more sophisticated, and has this scientific knowledge. And the western half, still administered out of Rome, is what falls apart under the people the Romans call barbarians. Um, but the various tribes from outside of the empire that come in and sack them from time to time and eventually come to rule themselves out of Rome, the Visigoths. So this all happens in the 5th and 6th centuries that this kind of stuff goes down. And so what's left in the West is total cultural chaos and where there used to be strong central government. And the, the cultural chaos in the West is what leads to feudalism. Um, where, where, where government is at the very local level and protection is at the very local level rather than at a national level. And edu edu education was non-existent in the feudal system, right? Um, I wouldn't say non-existent. You could get an education, particularly in a monastery, but, but, but it's, it's not the thriving um, contact with ancient knowledge and modern versions of that that they can get in the East. Yeah. But universities, however, outstrip everybody else in the world when they come in. And they come in partly as a result of rediscovering all that stuff that was lost. <coughs> but it gets rediscovered in the first round, not from Greek language and from the Byzantines, but from Islamic civilization. Because um, the, uh, the Muslim world, uh, um, the, the uh, Islam is, explodes out of Arabia in the 600s and then ends up covering huge parts of what used to be the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And the caliphs at Baghdad, around 800, have this great library they've taken over from the Persians, Parthians and others, with eastern knowledge and local knowledge, and they start adding to it. They hire trilingual people. They hire Nestorian Christians who've been thrown out of the Byzantine Empire for theological heresy and have moved east into Central Asia. And those Nestorians are, as a minority group, know the majority language, so they know Arabic. They also know their own Syriac language, and they can read Greek. And so these people get hired contracts from the Islamic government in Baghdad to translate ancient Greek works of mathematics and science and medicine 
into Arabic. And they get added to what then is the greatest library in the world in Baghdad in the ninth century. And then that, that knowledge spreads through the rest of Islamic civilization over the next couple hundred years, such that by the 11th century, the biggest library is in Cordoba, Spain. And that's it, but it's an Islamic library full of Greek literature and lots of other literature. It's that literature that starts to leak back into Europe in the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries that leads to the creation of the universities, the likes of which have not existed prior to them in certain technical senses. Um, it's, a, it's a European invention. Um, but they're studying these ancient texts in Latin translation, not done directly from the Greek at all, but done very circuitously. And then a couple centuries later, especially after the fall of the Byzantine Empire, and people, there's this mass exodus, there's a diaspora of the people living in there. They bring Greek texts with them to places like northern Italy and other parts of, of northern and western Europe. And that's, that's the long story. So yeah, there is, there is a period when a lot of the ancient ideas don't thrive, and that's mostly in northern and western Europe. They're preserving what they've got, but a lot of it they never had per, first access to anyway within the old Roman Empire. The last bilingual Romans, really, scholars, are about the 600s. After that, they're gone. And so they, they don't have this ability any longer because of this cultural collapse. Long, long story, sorry. <laughs> I'd like to take advantage of my responsibility to close things up right. by asking one last question. So okay. you, you've given us um, a lot of reasons to think that the conflict thesis is far too simple of an explanation for the interaction between religion and science, or Christianity and science in particular. Do you have any other examples of kind of grand overarching narratives that are also too simplistic? Um, we've seen the way that the conflict thesis gets adopted by a lot of different groups. Is there another story that gets told that you would also say is problematic because it's overly simplistic? I'm afraid I don't, I don't, I don't really see uh, a clear and obvious answer to what you're directly asking, so I'm gonna punt. Okay. Afraid. Maybe maybe for one of the other nights. Some other time when my head is somewhere else, for sure. I'm not thinking too much about these issues. Yeah. Then maybe I can think of something, but I just can't. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, let's let's give Ted a hand. Yeah.